Okay, I want to uh, start with a correction from last week. One of the points that I made was that the VB120, straight out of the box, I said initially could monitor up to 10 multicast addresses out of the box. Now, I always thought that this was zero, zero, and in fact it is zero, and the reason I was confused was because our website on the technical specifications for the VB120 is slightly ambiguous, and I've uh, mentioned this to Philip and Tim, and hopefully we're going to change that. So um, I thought it had been a change in the licensing on the VB120, but there is no change to the licensing of the VB120. Straight out of the box with the default uh, no no extra licenses, the VB120 can do one, uh, zero multicasts. So then there's 10, 20, 30, 40, up to 50, the maximum. Okay, so session two is about the probe GUI walkthrough. It, is, um, it isn't going to be a detailed functional description of the probe or any of the functions itself. That will come later when we delve into the individual sections. This is just a GUI walkthrough. So I'm going to present my web browser and move my web browser over to here so that we can see a probe. Now, I'm going to be using two probes. I'm going to be using a standard 120 and then I'm going to be using uh, a 220 with some cards in the slots two and three just so that I can show you the fully populated chassis. Um, you can ask questions at the end uh, or you can email me questions. The answers to any of the questions, if you ask me the questions, they will be automatically recorded. But if you email me questions, then of course um, they will be added to the video description on the YouTube video when it gets published tomorrow. So I'm going to be starting with the uh, the uh, VB120. Remember, this is purely about the GUI, and it's a hardware four probe, and it's currently at version 5.5, so 5.504. So um, this is the, the level that we are looking at. Some of the tabs that we see today won't be on earlier versions of this software and certainly won't be on earlier yeah. versions of the probe itself. Manuel, Manuel, can, can you mute your mic, please? Manuel, can you mute your mic, please? Manuel, can you mute your mic, please? Thank you. Uh, um, yes, so uh, the first thing I want to show you is, is, is a peculiarity of the web interface of the probe itself. Now if I quickly go to um, the VBC and just log in as the VBC and show you this VB120 which we're looking at. Now the first thing to notice or rather what I want to show you is uh, you probably already know this but nevertheless it's nice to know the VBC alarms at the bottom are in fact VBC alarms. They are filtered alarms from the probe. So they are the VBC alarms for this particular probe. Notice also that I cannot get rid of this alarm view. It's just there. So when I move to the probe itself, I'm just going to get rid of that. Um, so now I'm web browsing directly into the uh, probe by going straight to its web address. Uh, up the top there, 10.02.05.193. I don't. First of all, I don't see the VBC menu on the left, and I see a whole different sort of alarms. Now we'll get into this later when we discuss 
probe alarms and VBC alarms on a different session. But just for now, these are the probe alarms and the probe alarms are filtered when they go to the VBC. Um, someone's just asked me a, someone's just asked me a question. Um, what, uh, hold on, let me just get this question again. Uh, he's, okay, it's from Aaron saying he couldn't hear, but uh, he can. Uh, I can hear. Manuel, Manuel, are you still not hearing? Uh, I don't think Manuel. I, okay, we'll just have to carry on without Manuel. He can. Um, he can watch the recording tomorrow if he's not able to get in. The other thing I wanted to mo mention is this disclosure triangle. So I can click on this disclosures triangle and the alarms disappear from the view. Now you can't do that on the VBC, you can only do it on uh, a direct brow web browse uh, to the um, probe itself. And you just click that and up comes the, uh, the alarms. As I said before, the alarms are actually different. There are more alarms on the probe because they are filtered by the VBC and that's a user defined uh, threshold and we'll look at that when we look at the VBC alarms. Okay so now I'm gonna just go through the alarms, uh, go th sorry, go through the GUI and one of the things I want to show you uh, are the bulbs. So basically we have uh, a series of bulbs around the graphic of the chassis and they're either green, white, grey or red. As you can see, uh, data and management are both green, which means they're connected and there aren't any errors. Now, normally, when you see a white bulb, particularly in things like the ETR testing, a white bulb means it's in the process of testing. Now, it's not for this SFP. We don't have an SFP plugged in, so we're not actually seeing anything. But normally, white would mean in the process of being testing. Gray, you can see that the one PPS, the ASI in and out, are all grey, meaning it's not configured. We are ignoring what is going on on those particular connectors. Now they could have an ASI signal on them, but because they're not configured, we're not actually doing any monitoring. And it's the same with COFDM4 down at the bottom on the right. That is not configured. COFDM2 is however configured and it has an error. So red in this context means an error. And you can see there are multiple errors down in the uh, alarms at the bottom. Don't worry about that, that's purely for illustration purposes. Okay, so let's go on to CPU usage. Now sometimes if you have a problem with a probe, uh, customer support will ask you to look at the CPU usage. Now with a VB120 and a VB220, we've got two CPUs. Uh, with a VB330, we've got eight. I think it's eight, or is it four? I'm gonna have to check in a minute. Um, and these give you an idea of uh, what the CPUs are doing, how busy they are, and obviously in, in our particular case, mostly we're doing uh, idling. And we can actually look at this. We can see peaks. And we can change the uh, we can change the view to show different types of peaks, and we can even clear the peaks and start the measurement again. So this might be useful. It's the sort of thing that customer support might ask you. Thumbs overview. Now that's not very useful, is it? There aren't many thumbs there. Let's have a look at the uh, 120. Oh, there are a couple more thumbnails here. So any thumbnails that are decodable by the probe will be shown here. Now it's important to remember that these thumbnails, they stay on the probe. They do not go anywhere else. They're not accessible anywhere else, not by any documented uh, method anyway. And so they, uh, when you look at a VBC and you see the thumbnail display, the thumbnails on the VBC are not coming from the probes. They're coming from a VB288 thumbnail extractor. These thumbnails are purely for the use of the probe and its users. There's also, um, you can see that we can do a freeze frame. 
The freeze frame uh, enables us to check to see whether we are getting freeze frames on any of our videos. Now again, this is not to take the place of the VB288 QoE, QoS uh, content extractor. This is only usable on a VB120 and a VB220 and to some extent the VB330 as well. It's only usable for a couple of streams. In fact, I've heard support say for a VB120 and a VB220 a single stream. The probe can only manage freeze frame detection on a single stream. So if you've got a uh, suspecting a problem with a video and you can decode it of course, it can't be scrambled, you can't detect anything with a scrambled screen stream, then you could turn it on. I'll show you how to turn it on later. It's done in the ETR290 tab in the service thresholds. You have to turn it on there. EII graphing, external interface graphing, is purely uh, a meth, uh, purely a tool to enable you to draw graphs. Now we can let's just select a couple of plots just by just at random. We'll select three plots or three uh, IP streams, and let's select um, inter arrival time average, and then we'll apply that, and we'll plot a chart. And immediately these three streams are plotted on this graph of um, inter-arrival time average. So this is telling us the jitter. Effectively, this is showing us the jitter. Now you can leave that running for as long as you like, and you can get a, as long as you leave this window open, you will get a longer and longer and longer graph, which you can manipulate using these little things here to make the scale more readable or more compact. Now the only thing about this graph is it's only available on the probe. I can do a screen grab if I want to do a screen grab, that might be useful. But I cannot, at the moment, I can't export this. Let's just look at bitrate, see what that does. I can't export this. There's no, the, in, the external integration interface, even though it's under that tab, the external integration interface does not make these graphs available. However, of course, the external integration interface does make the raw data available. So systems like Data Miner come along and grab the raw data, and the raw data is then used to plot graphs. So the external integration interface on a probe will export the data, but it will not export the graphs themselves. That's just a key little uh, reminder of that. You can draw the graphs yourself if you want to go through the process of ex ex um, exporting the data from the probe and then using some graphics program to plot on a graph, you could certainly do that. But the only place you can see these graphs, and if I were to, if I to, if I were to go away from this, then, uh, oh, it does actually still, it will still, it's like a pop-up. These didn't used to be pop-ups, but they are now. So this pop-up will allow you, uh, whilst it's open, to graph these, this data. Okay, just a few things on this screen. Um, the network interface, uh, zero uh, and one, they're just being, uh, they're just um, showing us that they're okay and giving us some information about um, the, 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 the line speed of that particular uh, interface. We've also got things like uh, uh, the total traffic on the data sorry, uh, total traffic and then the data interface and the management interface details. The number of Ethernet streams that are joined. As you can see, we're joined on 35, but we're actually, we have 37 configured, but we're only joining, let's just make this a bit bigger. So we're only joining 35 of the 37. And there's other, there's more information there. We're looking at eight OTT channels with a total number of profiles of 25. So it's just a little bit of a summary screen. In fact, it's called the summary screen. <coughs> Usefully, if you're using the return data path and it's active and you forget, because it's very easy to forget that the uh, RDP is running, particularly if you found the fault, and this little bulb here will tell you it's active. Alarms are quite simple, really. Uh, they are broken down into uh, 
types of alarms and also summarized in the all alarms. So we have all alarms, uh, current alar Ethernet alarms, full service monitoring, come to that in a minute, OTT alarms, ETR alarms, system alarms, and alarm setup. So alarm setup is where the user decides whether uh, a particular condition causes an alarm. So first of all, you have to enable an alarm and then you select its severity. So in fact, I think the only fatal alarm is no contact with device. And that's a, a VBC, VBC alarm anyway. So all so the users can change these. It's quite extensive. It, basically every alarm type, every alarm type that is available on the probe is configurable by the users. This is nothing to do with thresholds. This is whether it generates an alarm in the first place. And then the thresholds then fine tune those alarms. Flash alarms. Flash alarms are uh, flash alarms are for when you have a flash a thirty two gigabyte flash alarm. I'm not even sure we've got one. Let's have a look on here. Uh, actually, it is installed. So we, the thirty two gigabyte uh, flash storage device is installed. So and if you remember from last week's um, session, this is a factory fitted option. It is not retrofittable. OK, so if we go to uh, data, that's odd. So my uh, flash, my SD card flash is not appearing there. So it tells me that it's installed, but I'm not seeing it. OK, well, I'll, I'll have to worry about that later. So the flat, any alarms with the flash writing to the flash or the flash getting full, uh, this would appear in the flash alarms. You can uh, you can filter all these alarms as, as you always could. Um, you can view the list offline. You can ex export them as a, a C uh, comma separated variable uh, spreadsheet and you can flash them. So you can you can get all the alarms and you can uh, delete all the alarms. There were some flash alarms had the ability to to do to do a search on particular alarms. So filter alarms. I'm not sure why that's quite so. Uh, actually, there are. OK, so there are some alarms. Not entirely sure why they. Ah, yes, the ability to f the ability to uh, store more than four days of alarms on the, f the uh, flash card, which I believe is in the process of being implemented. OTT, I'm not going to go too far into the OTT at the moment uh, because there's a whole session on o just on OTT. In fact, there are two sessions, one on OTT theory and the other on OTT monitoring. The thing to notice here is we have the ability to monitor two hours. So this graph that we're showing, the alarm, the alarm history graph, which you can you can mouse over and see the alarms as they as they have appeared. You can change it between two hours, 24 hours and four days. And there's just a little a little bit of uh, uh, script down there telling you what each individual engine is doing, because remember, all the engines are working. Um, they're working. Uh, the, the profiles are being tested and the, the um, streams are being tested in a round robin fashion. So we'll come back to OTT in the OTT sessions and we'll do exactly the same with the multicasts. There's a whole tutorial. In fact, the next the next uh, multi the next session next Tuesday is about multicast monitoring and thresholds. So I just want to run you through a couple of little things here. First of all, when you land on the uh, multicast tab parameters, you always go to user defined parameters. There are others that you can use. So for example, if I was just wanted to look at my IP parameters, or if I wanted to look at my transport stream parameters, or if I was looking at RTP, for example, and my forward error correction, then I could show these default views. 
but user defined is the standard landing page and um, by pressing the fields button then I can choose what columns appear in this table and the one I always check is I always check the let's just put the page one on and the IP packets on and apply so when we go back now to parameters uh, you'll see first of all page number one well of course we're only looking at page number one there is page number one there um, and also the num total number of IP packets here so 21 oh gosh 200 oh, it's, uh, quite a lot you're, 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 you're hello hello Rudolf, can you uh, can you um, silence your your mic, please? Somehow you managed to un unmute it. Anyway. So you can choose the uh, you can choose the pr the columns that you see in your um, uh, in your user defined view, and of course you can skip to pages. We'll come to pages in a minute. So we can go pa to pages. We can give these pages meaningful names. We'll see that later. Um, and when let let let's. I better put that back to where it was so I'm going to get rid of the pages and I'm going to get rid of the IP packets and apply so it's back to where it was now summary screen is just a, a, a summary of all of the errors on a page by page basis so we'll look at error seconds in a minute I'll deal in I'll deal in more details with error seconds next week uh, but we're, we're just looking at error seconds per page and again we can s select this between um, eight hours, uh, one minute, eight hours, and four days. History just gives me the ability, I've never seen anyone use this very much, it gives me the ability to um, again do make a graph. So I can make a graph of things like uh, total bit rate ver versus no signal versus CC errors. Um, and you can read this off if you want to, but it enables you to draw a graph that may or may not be useful to you. This is the total interface, by the way. It's not, it's not on a stream basis. This is the total multicast traffic into this probe. Now, detect gives you the ability to detect multi. I'm not sure I understand. The ability for the. Um, the probe to detect multicasts. Now, I'm just going to quickly go to setup mode. Now, you must be the probe must be in promiscuous mode to for detect to work. And the other thing is the uh, switch to which this connect this port. Sorry, the switch to which the probe is connected must be set up to forward multicast to the port because there's no join involved in, in this in detection there's no join involved so the, the the switch won't automatically forward that stream to the port without a join uh, session announcement protocol I'm not going to go into that at the moment uh, this is quite new uh, but this gives the probe the ability it's quite a new feature it gives the probe a, an ability to uh, detect session announcement protocol where it comes from and what it is Join. Now, join is um, interesting. Uh, join uh, gives you the ability to look at particular um, streams. For example, let's just say Fox HD, and I could add it to a particular page. So I could add it to f movies. That probably wasn't a good choice. Um, let's just pretend Fox HD's movies. And I could add it to the page movies. Page three movies. And in doing that, it joins as well so it issues a join so that's one way of populating your pages uh, first of all you have to have named your pages and so you go to set up and pages so then you need you you add your 
page names here. Give them a name that means something. Then you can go back and you can, uh, you can add them to these pages. The other way, of course, of adding them is when you actually add the multicast in the first place. Because when you add a multicast, or I'm editing one at the moment, I can select the page there as well. So there are two methods of joining, uh, of putting a multicast onto a particular page. So streams, again, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail uh, today. Uh, this is really just showing you what they are. Again, I'm just, just um, reiterating what I've said before. We can sort on any of these columns. Whenever you see a tabular view in a probe, whenever you see a table, you can always sort by the grey column header. So if I wanted to see all of the joined multicasts in a group, I could select, well, that's joined up, now joined down, and there it is in descending order. I can do the same with thumbnails, for example. And I could just sort by multicast address. So it's very easy to sort on these. And again, the normal default is on name. Ethernet thresholds, we'll go into these next week. Default thresholds, there are four default thresholds. And remember, I know I've said this lots of times before, and I'll probably say it lots of times in the future. You cannot edit or delete the default thresholds. You can only duplicate one and rename it and then edit it. Media window. Media window is just the same page that we were looking at on the multicast page. But now we're seeing a graph and we can see it over four days, 24 hours, or we can see it dynamically moving now. The graph is on the left. Uh, let's find some errors. Uh, not many errors, actually. Well, there were. But actually, this is quite a useful teaching aid because we have had errors. We've had drop packets and high jitter, and it happened at the same time on all of our streams. So it probably wasn't, um, it certainly wasn't an individual stream problem. It may have been a problem with something like an IRD. Uh, we could look at one of those in a bit more detail by clicking on that, but we'll come up, we'll come back to that later. There it is, so we can actually see when it happened. Happened over quite a long period of time, actually. So you can see it happened over a long period of time. So there's some definite problem there. You can look at all streams by clicking the all button, but it's no longer live. So although we're seeing all of the streams, it, if you look at that error, it affected almost every stream on this probe. So again, it's quite useful, but it's not updating live. Um, into arrival time uh, versus media, um, media loss rate, so in other words jitter versus drop packets is the default view. We can also show bandwidth and whenever you show bandwidth it automatically shows as a, a blue graph. If we do a in a bit more detail here, bandwidth is blue. And then we can select into arrival time versus RTP drops. Um, now this is a UDP stream, so we don't we won't expect to see any RTP drops. So the the graph is grey. But if we can find some RTP streams, I think we've got some RTP streams. Yeah, we've got an RTP stream. R1 is RTP, and I can tell that because it's purple. So if you click on the RTP button, then you will see. Um, the RTP figures. Now we've not had any RTP drops in four days, but we have had considerable jitter. So purple means RTP, and if I select a different one and show RTP, it, oh that one is that one is uh, RTP. It's grey. So grey means um, UDP. So the return data path, return data path is uh, a very useful tool, not used very often, um, but it allows you to. I'm, I'm going to get do a whole, uh, a whole session, not not a whole session on RDP, but um, it will be in a particular thing, a uh, particular session called hidden probe features. I've called it hidden because they're not used by many people. 
um, but RTP uh, used to be, uh, RDP used to be one RDP engine but now we've got two RDP engines and effectively all I'll say at this stage is we can make a transport stream recording we can make a transport stream recording either we can record now by pressing the record button and I can select uh, oops I can select what I record you can record any transport stream in the probe, whether it comes from an ASI input or from a multicast or from an RF card. You select the input, we've only got an ASI card here, uh, an ASI input rather, and Ethernet. And then you select the channel, and then you just do a recording. However, it really, it's really clever when you do a triggered recording. And a triggered recording, you basically select an error, and that triggers a recording. And we can do the same with RDP2. Two completely independent engines. They can be acting differently um, and looking for different things. The other thing is that it does is it relays over IP. So if you had a probe somewhere out on the edge of your network, you could uh, relay a stream back down the network to your PC, for example, in the head end. So you could have somewhere up in a transmission transmitting station having a problem with the stream, just send it back, send it back over the uh, network. And you can do that by just putting the IP, the IP destination address there. Very useful. Traffic, this is one of the things that we'll be looking at in the hidden probe features. Basically, we're looking at the, uh, all of the traffic on Ethernet 1. Or we could look at all of the traffic on Ethernet zero. And this gives us a breakdown of all of our traffic. So UDP mostly, that doesn't that won't surprise anyone. But we can we look at things like differential uh, service code or oh, DSCP, I can never remember what it stands for. Um, what used to be uh, what used to be TOS type of service. Uh, things like uh, IGMP, you can test the traffic, uh, ARP traffic. So every anything that appears on the interface is uh, shows here and you can see it by percentage terms and you can look at the statistics or you can even draw a graph if you want and again these clever graphing tools that uh, that are available you can sh you can make these graphs it's not particularly interesting on this graph but there might be something there that's interesting you might want to look at how your um, ARP traffic is you might be tracking down a network problem. It may not necessarily be a problem with a multicast. There may be, there may be other network problems that the probe can help you find. And these are the one, some of the tools that can help you do that. So that's bit rates and then Ethernet frames, of course. So we can do the same thing with frames. Detect, well, we've already seen detect in multicast. Uh, this is exactly the same. This is exactly the same display. Um, as, as it was in multicast detect. Exactly the same. Filter statistics, now I'm not going to go into this too too much, but you can set up filters to, you can set up up to 10 filters and it will filter all of the traffic coming in on a particular interface. So you could say, well, test one, only multicasts, or test two, only, only uh, packets without RTP, for example. So you can make multiple tests and then you can use these filter then you can use these filters to draw graphs again. Oh that's really boring. This may be more so so for example if you set a range of UDP, if you set a range of uh, IP um, source addresses you could monitor the IP traffic that's coming from a range of source addresses so particularly like a bank of IRDs or some other some other um, just a bank of encoders for example uh, VOD servers you could say all of the uh, all of the VOD, all of the VOD servers between these two IP addresses all the traffic I want to check that because you might want to look at things like micro bit rating micro bit rate we'll talk about this in a bit more detail later it basically allows you to. Um, it basically allows you to um, um, check the maximum bit rate at various um, various uh, intervals. So we have one second interval, a uh, hundred milliseconds interval, 
10 milliseconds and one millisecond. So basically you're measuring the peak because some transmitters send very fast over a very short period of time, particularly in OTT, of course OTT. So you may be seeing very bursty, uh, very bursty conditions from a particular server and this enables you to tr track that. So you need to apply it, you need to turn it on. By, by definition it's off and then it will start to grow, it will start to show these graphs in exactly the same way we've seen other graphs and you can see that uh, the uh, light blue is the one millisecond. So at one millisecond we are bursting at uh, 300 meg. So we're bursting at 300 meg and our and over a second the burst is 200 uh, is 230 meg. So you can see we are getting some very very high bitrate bursts over very short periods of time. Now this again this is another tool for looking at network issues and possibly OTT issues. Okay, moving on to ethernet. Now there's several tabs here. I'm not going to go into huge amount of detail. Uh, the first thing it comes up is this is not used very much at all full service monitoring this gives me the ability this gives me the ability to just check on various IP addresses so these can be any IP addresses in the network it could be something like a video server it could be something like a, um, an encryption server something like that a key server it could be anything in the network NTP so basically, if, if you've got something in your network that you want to just check that it's still alive, then you can then you can do it. You can there are various methods, HTTP, GET and PING. So we're using PING and it will check. It will check uh, every uh, I th I'm not sure what it is, actually. Uh, I think the defaults every 20 seconds. Oh, no, once a minute, once a minute, it will check. And you can set it up here, add them. We'll go into this in a bit more detail. You can also set the probe up as a syslog server. Now, I don't expect this to interest people very off, uh, very much. This was done specifically for one customer. I don't, um, I don't recall ever seeing an, another customer use it. But the probe can be set up as a syslog server, if that's something your customers are interested in. IGMP, so we log all the IGMP traffic. Um, we can we can look at this, and so if we need if we're having problems joining multicasts or multicasts come dropping out, uh, then we can check the IGMP traffic. Maybe the switch isn't set up properly uh, because the switch is you know the switch isn't is is not is not refreshing or some some other IGMP issue. So you can make sure that the uh, that you're seeing the IGMP. Uh, join and membership requests here. PCAP, well I've already shown you the return data path, the ability to um, record transport streams. Uh, standard feature by the way, All of, so far everything that we've seen are standard features. Uh, OTT is not a standard feature, you have to license OTT of course. But PCAP is another licensable feature, sorry a free feature. So we can do PCAP recordings. In other words, if you don't know what a PCAP recording is, it's basically, uh, whereas before we were capturing the transport stream as an MPEG, a .ts file, this is a .pcap file. So we're actually, we're actually recording the IP packets. The, the IP packets, the headers, all the headers, the UDP, the RTP, the IP, you know, all of those headers. And we can even, we can, we can capture the uh, payload as well if you want. Um, and you can select just the header, so you're not interested in the payload, but you select the header, and then you can do some uh, you can do some capturing, uh, you can do some filtering on what you want capture with the source and destination address, UDP, TCP, TCP and UDP, blah 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 blah, and then start recording, and then that will record and provide you with a PCAP file, only one, just one. So as soon as you do it, you will record. Uh, you will record over the previous recording. Now if you have the SD card, the 32 gig SD card, then that will transfer the recording onto the SD card. So you can make multiple recordings of PCAP files. But you do need to have the um, you do need to have the uh, 32 gig SD card option. 
I think it's called the Flash Opt. And remember, just just a just a final reminder, it's a factory fit option, not retrofit. ETR290, well, probably lots of you have seen the ETR290, or if not all of you. Uh, I'm just going to go through this really quickly. There's a couple I just want to bring up. Uh, ETR overview, showing you the micro ETR, the ETR details. Of course, ETR uh, is not just ETR. It's ETR priority one, priority two, priority three. And it's also the other checks that BridgeTech have added. These other checks, particularly PID and service checks and the Gold TS and interface checks. Well, not much going on on this particular interface because it's it's just IP. Um, PIDs, just a list of the PIDs that are in this particular uh, engine. Services, one particular service. And we can also use this to generate a thumbnail, the same thumbnail that we saw uh, earlier. There won't be anything on this because it wasn't on the other one. But it's exactly the same information that we could see in multicasts. Bit rates simply. Actually, let's switch to the um, let's switch to the COFDM Pro because it's a bit more interesting. So uh, let's make it a bit bigger. Get rid of that. So bit rates. We've got. Oh, we've still only got one service. Damn. Oh, there we go. We've got multiple services on this COFDM one. So. Um, so basically it gives you a minimum maximum bit rate just min max bars and we can even see min max on the individual components the video and the audio so that's quite nice for logging stuff tables all of the tables are there um, it's something I wanted to show you I wanted to show you uh, an event information table uh, I don't think it's available on is it available on any of the others so that one's got an error. Oh, there is EPG, yeah. So you can actually see EPG. Um, so you can see the present following, or now, next, whatever you want to call it. Current, next. So we can see that information in the EIT. Um, and we can also show um, full EPG. If, if you're showing full seven-day EPG, then basically you can click on that link and that will give you the full EPG for that particular um, channel. And then we can show a different channel and we can show a seven day EPG there. So again, that's quite useful. Um, you can't at the current, you can't currently, exp I don't believe you can export it. No, it's just, it's just visible there. That's all. Program clock reference. Well, if you're doing program clock reference, it's not been enabled and any of this has to be enabled, but then you get your um, uh, standard uh, plus or minus 500 nanoseconds. A jitter. If you're doing a T2MI, there's no T2MI um, on this particular stream. If you're, you know, you're doing a DVB T2 um, and you're using T2MI, then that this is where you'd see the T2MI analysis. I want to go back to my other probe because this probe has SCTI 35, SCT 35. Now, don't there aren't any SCT 35 events in this transport stream. Um, and this is a licensable option. This is not something which is a standard feature. So if we go to the about and license very quickly, you'll see SCT35 is an, a purchasable option. Very useful if you're trying to track things, you know, uh, add inserts, any of that sort of thing, regional opt-outs, anything that uses SCT35, then there it is. And we can also export that now. The um, I think in the in the either this version of software 5.5 or 5.6 coming up, this will be externally uh, grabbable by the external integration interface, right? Um, so we would you you can extract the uh, 35 information from a probe. Status, well, this is the status of uh, a particular. Let's go back to the uh, probe status and compare so basically this is showing us all of the errors on a basically all of the errors on this particular transport stream and they're just there it's, it's just loads of them so uh, this will give you a um, this will give you a look to show you 
uh, any uh, any errors that are on the complete transport stream, not broken down by service, everything that's there. You can even compare, you can compare two streams. So let me pick these two streams. Two streams on the same probe, remember. This is just the streams on the same probe, and we can compare them as a selected probe. And this will give you some information about, well, there's not the, they're completely different, so that I'm not actually seeing much anyway. So we could see, we could compare, uh, we could compare different uh, streams, different uh, TSs uh, on the same probe. We could compare them and we could basically do any comparison we want to do. Alarm comparison and so on and so forth. ETR thresholds again, this the whole, uh, we'll be doing a whole session on ETR. Uh, PID thresholds, we'll be looking at this uh, in a different session. Basically we can make multiple tests on individual PIDs, either by PID number or PID type. So very useful, Com quite complex to set up, but extremely flexible and you can, you can detect very subtle errors by building tests. Service thresholds, I just want to show you a couple of things on a service threshold. Some, some one that's actually got something in it. Okay, one service. So you can see you can check by type and service ID. Um, but I want to show you a couple of things here. I want to show you the uh, um, uh, uh, where was it? Where was it? Uh, sorry, I'm looking for Oops, lots of tests. This particular uh, threshold has got lots of tests. Okay, I want to look at schedule. Schedule allows me to, for a particular service, allows me to schedule an alarm mask. I'll show you that in a minute, a bit more detail. But basically, if you want to, if you had Disney Junior went off air between say 2100 and 0600 the next morning, and it went to no signal, then basically you'd get an alarm for, for um, six, nine hours. You just get a no signal alarm for nine hours. Well, you can just mask that out and you mask it out using the schedule. And something else I'll show you in a minute. Uh, oh, it's not on that one, that's why. Um, service threshold. So we talked about freeze frame sensitivity. Remember we talked about freeze frame? Um, let me just remind you, I wanted to go back to main thumbs overview, freeze frame. You can see freeze frame everywhere here, but there's only one that's actually being looked at and it's this one here, freeze frame. In the uh, hyperdeck and it's yellow. All the, all the rest are gray and remember gray bulb means not tested, ignored. So if we go back to ETR 290 and we go to the service threshold, this is where you add a freeze frame. So you add it to the particular service. And remember, you can only do it really, you can only do it on one service at a time, one multicast stream at a time. So you'd add it, you'd make it trigger seldom, not very sensitive, trigger often, very sensitive and normal. And there's the schedule again. Multiple schedules here. We'll look at those in a minute. Gold TS. We'll have a we'll have a session on Gold TS. Gold TS just enables you to take a snapshot of a uh, so-called perfect transport stream and use that perfect transport stream as a reference stream. And then you just basically, as the transport stream is coming in, you measure it continuously. 24-7 against the reference stream and if it deviates any in any way if any if any change to the transport stream makeup then you get a gold TS alarm. Now going back to the probe you notice this has got COFDM 1, 2, 3 and 4. Looking at the main alarm you can see we've got a 252 card and another 252 card. And we've got COFDM1, COFDM2. COFDM2 is in error, so it's not able to pick it up. COFDM3 and COFDM4 is grey, so we're not even checking. Grey is not checked, ignored. So this has basically got all four, all four COFDM inputs have been enabled. 
And as soon as you plug a card in and you enable the uh, the second input, then it automatically appears on the uh, automatically appears on the GUI. So you don't have to worry about configuring it. You plug a satellite card in, and up will pop a two seven two card, a satellite card, Sat one. And if you enable the second satellite input, up will pop a tab, Sat two. So it's it's very very simple. Uh, you, it's it's hot swappable, so you can plug a new card in and it will appear. ASI, I think we've currently turned it off. Yes, it's disabled. So if we, we, if we were to enable the uh, ASI and apply the changes, and now it's enabled, but it goes straight into error because there's nothing connected to it. And if we go back to the main screen, now we can see we've got an error. By the way, you can, if I go to the ASI and do the setup, I can um, ASI out. ASI out is the AS, you I can select actually. I've, no, I haven't got a card here. If I go to my COFDM card and I look at the setup, then I can select a transport stream from one of my RF cards or ASI card. I could select it to go into the output. So you could use it like a little loop through. Okay, so that's ASI. So I better go and turn that one off again so that the alarm's no longer there. So disable that, apply changes. And now we've come to the last three and we'll skip through these quite quickly. Parameters, various parameters. We remember we already talked about uh, promiscuous mode and you join multicast. You want to join the multicast, obviously. If you're in um, uh, promiscuous mode and use, use detect, Enable session announcement protocol discovery. So if you've got SAP and you want to use it, then you need to turn it on here. If you're using source specific multicasting, SSM, then you need to turn that on here as well. If you're, if you're sending um, SNMP traps, then they are sent here. This is where you set your trap destinations. Uh, remember, when, when we looked at alarms, if we disable an alarm, if we disable that alarm um, like that, if I disable my FEC packet drop alarm and the probe sees FEC packet drops, it will not forward those as SNMP traps. SN that does, it's not um, unsurprising to my mind. Yeah, of course, it doesn't send forward, but you have to remember that. So uh, if you disable it, if, you, if you're not getting if you're not getting the particular errors in your SNMP traps, then check that they are not disabled because the probe may still see them, although it won't generate an alarm, the probe may still see them, particularly things like uh, TS sync. You can still see a TS sync and you can still see uh, a sync by error. You can still see them, but they just don't generate alarms and then they don't get forwarded as SNMP traps. Uh, NTP, well, that's fairly straightforward. You can give your probe a name, uh, something that's meaningful. Pages, we looked at pages very quickly. Um, colors, I'm not going to go into color lists, but you can, you can, uh, you can define an RGB color that will cause the uh, probe to monitor this color for freeze frame. So if the freeze frame uh, goes to green, as we've got green, 00, zero FFC is zero, 00, and the probe sees this, then it will, um, it will detect a freeze frame. Time, well, we're using NTP, but if you weren't using NTP, not sure why you wouldn't be, to be honest, but you could. It was a standalone probe. Maybe it's a, a nomad or something that you're using, you're using uh, different parts of the network. Then you can set the time and date up there. Ethernet just gives you the ability to set the uh, Ethernet parameters for the uh, different interfaces. Of course, we've got the management interface, we've got the uh, SFP interface and the RJ45 interface, and they're set up there. And then we get a nice little status uh, telling us how these um, interfaces are behaving. VLANs, we can now define up to 100 VLANs. We have defined 100 VLANs here by the looks of it, yes and you can edit them as well. 
So we do support VLANs fully now and up to 100. That might actually be quite new because there are a couple of things on here that are, are, are new. The uh, SAP is one of them and this is another one. Um, uh, the, the number is, is um, of 100 is new. VBC simply uh, you can uh, allow the VBC to monitor, not monitor, obviously monitor, but you can uh, allow the VBC to um, auto detect any probes. But you have to turn it on in the probe in the first place. So it's a little bit odd, but you turn it on the probe and then you connect it up. And then it takes about five minutes actually. I've seen it take longer than five minutes, but it, the VBC will effectively, it will detect it after a while. As long as you put the right destination address for the uh, VBC server. Uh, you can enable access control so you can give um, you can give the probe a, a username and password. In fact it has a username and password by default admin Elvis but you can change those if you want so that only people can get in that have those passwords. Um, ETRs it's a bit if you if you're doing private descriptors uh, then this this is where you would uh, to particular PIDs, uh, you can you can you can change those here. You can uh, you can change the tag. Um, now this is quite useful. Allow unauthorized users to lock tuning, or limit tuning. If we go back, let me just go back to the ETR two ninety. No, I'm going to have to go on my COFDM probe. In fact, it's not going to work. I can actually lock a particular. Have we got any? We're not doing anything that's got more than one uh, stream in a in a service. But I can, I could if if this COFDM, which one's which one's the one that's working? Oh, Try to find one that's uh, okay. Let's just turn all of these on. So we're going to tune. All, we're going to try and tune to all of these. Some of them may not be correct. They may be broken. But OK, this one's working. So now, well, at the end, as you probably already know, at the end of 70 seconds, it will retune to the next channel on this COFDM card. I'm not sure what's happening with the constellation diagram. It's all going to be a bit funky. But if I wanted to log it, lock it, I could lock it to this particular uh, channel, 626 meg. And I can lock it, and this will stay locked for as long as I press the lock until I go to ETR. And then I can limit the authorized users to 60 minutes. I've changed that to 30. So after 30 minutes, that, un that lock will unlock. Useful at the end of the shift, you forgot you've locked it, and you go home, and you suddenly remember in the middle of the night, oh my god, th there's no testing being done on those other five COFDM channels only one so you know we won't get any errors we won't see any errors on those other COFDM channels overnight because I've left it locked anyway you can do that here there's some other things in there we won't go into those at the moment measure log now I've been trying to find out all week what this does I have no idea it's brand new don't really know what it does at the moment BBC thresholds well in exactly the same way that uh, uh, IP traffic IP multicasts and uh, ETR 290 have got thresholds so have the so has the VBC. Now we talked about this earlier when I said that some 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 um, some alarms don't go to the VBC. Well, this is where they're set up. Scheduling. This is where we set up our schedules. Let's go back to the other probe, and this is where we can set up when these masks appear scheduled when we can schedule these masks and we can say all days between 00 and 0200 2300 and 2400 so basically between 2300 and 0200 no alarms will be shown during midnight and then you assign that in the service threshold routing this basically says where you force particular traffic so when when i um when I, you can set up default interfaces, but here I can force my OTT traffic onto Ethernet SFP, uh, Ethernet 2, the data SFP. 
So if my and I could force my OTT traffic, my OTT requests, and the downloading chunks onto a particular interface, so it doesn't interfere with my multicast traffic on the other interface, for example. And security. Now I need to log in to show security. Admin Elvis. And I can basically turn on things like FTP, Telnet. And then there's a new, um, there's a new um, TACAX, TACAC Plus, which is coming. I guess it's not, it's not part of the uh, current. It's not part of the current. Uh... Oh no, it's not on here. Anyway, we've we've introduced TACAX Plus, this uh, encryption um, secure security method um, that's uh, developed by Cisco. Uh, if you know about TACAX Plus, then then you'll know more than I do because I don't really know much about it. But it is, um, it is. Um, uh, it is enabled here. So you turn off things like spoofing, SNMP and all that sort of stuff here. Uh, oh, there's TACAX. Sorry, yeah. So you need to put on a, you need to put on a TACAX server and the secret. So presumably that's like a password. Authentication is disabled, but we can use TACAX as our authentication. So basically it proves to whatever asks that uh, we are who we say we are. So I think it's a bit like certification. Local users, you can add usernames and only those people can log into the probe. And then you can enable access control from various uh, sources. Again, that's fully described there. And you can change the password. Well, obviously it's Elvis at the moment, but you can change the password. So data, a couple of things to show you here. Um, you can download these uh, configurations and they're great for backups. You can download the full configuration, um, but you might want to say, you might want to download the um, ethernet thresholds, or you might want to download all your stream list because you want to load it off onto another probe. And you can do that. So you can download the XML file and you can edit the XML file, and then you can reload it on another, another probe. The problem is, the problem with that is, is it, you'll get, normally you'll get an error you'll get an error when you try and load it. And there's a very good reason for this. And I'm showing you uh, a typical file here. Uh, I don't make that any bigger. Can I make that a bit bigger? Yeah. And the reason is, is because every file's got a CRC. So a cyclic redundancy check. And of course that CRC is calculated on the uh, bit pattern of the file itself. So if you change the file, the CRC no longer works because it doesn't match the bit pattern of the file. So if you edit any of these configuration files offline, you have to delete the CRC field. You can't recalculate it. Well, I'm sure there must be a method somewhere, but you can't recalculate it um, easily. So the easiest thing is just to delete it and then the probe doesn't mind. You can upload that without any problem. The other thing, oh, let's just move that out of the way. Um, so you can software and license now you can now download this the hardware key and the current license key download that just by clicking on here send that straight to uh, the your business partner manager or Morton and he will send you a new uh, uh, license key and also debug data and this is really useful because this takes several log files from the probe and it zips them up well, it doesn't zip them up technically it, it puts them into a tarball which again is a Linux, a Linux uh, equivalent of a zip file, and then just downloads it. So whenever support says, "Oh, can you send me the debug data?" You do not have to go into the probe and SSH into the probe and find all the log files and tar them up and then export them. You just basically click on debug data. Much much easier. Software again, you probably already know this. Um, you can upload a new software file here. Table descriptors. If you are, um, if you if you are um, uploading table descriptors, we looked at the table descriptors in the ETR tab. Um, then you can upload, and you've done those offline. Then you can br bring them in here. The external integration 
uh, interface is just um, it's just a couple of files that show you how the external integration interface works. There's a whole manual about this. It's available in the manuals. Um, it's available in the manuals um, um, section of the website of the business partner website, and uh, there it is. Now, storage. We have storage. We have external storage. Sorry, it's not external. We have additional storage on this probe. So we do have the um, SD opt, the flash opt. Maybe I was looking at the wrong probe earlier. Here it is, uh, flash 32 opt. So we do have it. So it's in data and storage. And there are our, as you can see, lots and lots of, um, oh, lots of CSV files. People have been playing with the, the C <coughs> Excuse me, the um, COFDM files. But this is where your um, um, TS recordings and your PCAP files will all be downloaded here. And you can just click and download them. You can even reload, rename them. Quickly, about. Interestingly, this is now, this is quite new. It's now telling me there's a newer version. So it's telling me there's a 0 0 5 version. I could up, up, upload that. Well, no, I first of all I have to download it by clicking the link and then I'd go back to data and software and then upload it, so to speak. License, we've already seen license several times. You say you want the flat, this is on, of course, on this probe. Uh, if I wanted the second, the SCUTTY 35 option, then I would ask for that and then input the software key here or go to our online license manager, which again is becoming more and more. Uh, a part of the way that we license probes. Uh, that, uh, that's it. Uh, I'm just quickly looking at system again. If you're if if you go to support, you have a support call. It's probably worth sending them uh, a screen grab of this particular page just to show that everything is running. Again, debug files here. We can get the debug files and we can get the system status. So again support may well ask you for this data it's so it's quite it's quite useful for you to know where to find them rather than asking support it's a little bit always embarrassing a bit to ask support well how do i download my log files so debug files there uh log files there well debug data sorry same same thing Just idiot so my debug, it takes, it takes a while to do it, by the way, because it, it, there's a lot of files and they have to be tarballed up. So uh, there are a lot of files. It takes a, you know, a minute or so. Don't expect it to appear straight away. OK, gentlemen, I've gone on for 10 minutes longer than I expected. I'm very sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to ask if there are any questions that can be asked. Uh, please feel free to ask questions. If you don't want to ask the questions online, if you need to get off, you might need to get off. I've kept you 10 minutes later. Then please email me the questions and I'll make sure they're included in the video recording. Other than that, gentlemen, I will say thank you very much for your uh, company for the last hour. And thank you very much for attending. I hope to see some of you, if not all of you, next week. And uh, I look forward to having the, the, the quiz, uh, probably a little bit simpler this time, less ambiguity in the uh, quiz and fewer questions. So have a go at the quiz, see how it goes. Remember, there's a prize at the end of it all for ev everyone who gets more than 70%. So keep cracking on. And thank you very much and goodbye.